Okay. Well, welcome everybody. So this is what we call the, the virtual campfire. Um, and we got a mixture of folks that are a part of the uh, ongoing nature's language community here. So we get together uh, monthly. We're actually gonna be getting together a couple times a month online over the, the springtime uh, and chat about things around nature awareness and tracking, bird language, weather, all that kind of stuff. Uh, and I thought it'd be kind of fun maybe just to open up one of these to the public. So, you know, you've heard of open houses before. Uh, since we call this the virtual campfire, I thought we'd call it the open fire. Uh, I just made that up, but uh, yeah, <laughs> I thought it was kind of fun. So um, yeah, our game plan for tonight um, is I'm going to just go over a couple logistics really quickly. Uh, then we're going to do a little bit of birding by ear. So start working on our, our spring birding, knowing that so many birds are starting to migrate and fly back. Oh my goodness, already starting to hear red wings down in Niagara. That's wild. <laughs> I can't even imagine. So uh, yeah, we're going to do a little bit of birding by ear. Um, we're going to have a, a little bit of a breakout group and a brainstorm around uh, kind of early signs of spring and what are some of the more subtle signs of spring. Uh, I always love tracking that part. And then uh, I've got some a couple slides prepared. We're going to dive into some tracking questions, uh, particularly around uh, specific spring tracking. Uh, things. So there's certain animals that can be really easy to mix up in the springtime looking at their footprints. Uh, so I've got some slides and we'll chat about those. And there's a couple of pictures from inside the community that people have posted um, that I'd like to as well. So anyways, that's that's kind of where we're going to go with tonight's plan. We'll probably be about an hour and a half for the evening. Uh, and as I mentioned, there will be a little breakout group at some point, a chance to connect with the community. Uh, you're welcome to sit out on that one. Or if you want to participate, you're more than welcome to um, or you can just go and be a fly on the wall. You can listen and not speak. So just totally up to you what you want to do with that. So, ah, all right. Well, maybe to start us off, you know, I always like starting things off, just bringing our minds together. I, I like to call it kind of bringing the outdoors in. So uh, I'm going to invite everyone just really quickly uh, to take an opportunity to just close your eyes for a second, if you're comfortable doing that. And take a couple slow, long breaths in through your nose, out through your mouth. And as you take this next breath, I want you to imagine yourself out in your favorite spot in nature right now. Sitting in a park or down by a lake or a river or a creek, some place that you just really cherish, that just makes your body feel good. And try and imagine yourself there with all of your senses in this moment. Feel the breeze blowing across your skin. Is it cool or is it warm? Is it dry or is it moist? What might this spot smell like right now? Can you feel that humidity coming in through your nostrils? What sounds would you hear in this place? Can you hear the red winged blackbird? The robin, a crow? Just feel yourself sitting on the earth there, connected to the land fully aware of your surroundings, fully tuned into your senses. And from that place, I invite you to think about what's something you really feel grateful for today? What's something you feel grateful for in this moment? And come on back into the room. And uh, if you're feeling it, maybe just share in the chat what you're feeling grateful for right now. We'd love to hear from you. Man, I'm feeling super grateful for so many things. Uh, it's fun to have some family on the call here. I got my, uh, my wife's mom and my, my second mom, uh, Susan on, and her other daughter and my other sister, Wendy, here. So uh, I'm thankful to have family with us here tonight. Uh, I'm thankful for all of you folks tuning in. Uh, I'm really thankful to live in a place where we have winter still and where I've got snow. Uh, I, I love the winter. I got to say, you know, when everyone's getting all excited about the spring, I always feel a little bit sad. I'm like, oh, can we have one more month? Uh, I just love the snow for tracking, for, for getting outdoors, for uh, ice fishing and skiing and all those fun things. So uh, that's what I'm feeling grateful for tonight, along with all of you wonderful folks being here. So let's start off tonight. Oh, actually, sorry. I did want to just mention a couple of logistical things first. So there is the chat. If you're not familiar with Zoom, I think most people are these days. Uh, you can scroll down. You'll see the little chat there. You have the options to turn your screen on and off at the bottom there, or sorry, your camera. Uh, if you're finding that it's a little bit choppy, feel free to turn your video off. 
um, and it might speed up. Although I always like it if people are open to leaving the videos on. I think it's kind of fun to be able to see people's faces when we're doing this and it just adds to the community vibe. So um, there's that piece for logistics. The other thing I just wanted to mention for folks that are part of the nature's language community, we've been doing these calls once a month, but I've actually booked uh, a few guest speakers and we're going to be doing them a little bit more regularly this spring, which I'm excited. And I'm going to introduce one of them right now and just put them on the spot really quick. But um, Sandy Reed is somebody that I've been connecting with over the last year. Um, uh, an amazing naturalist. She actually goes down and spends part of her year in Africa every year uh, down there tracking wildlife in Africa. Uh, amazing teacher, educator. Um, has some incredible stories. So she's going to be actually in the community uh, a little bit more over the springtime. Uh, so you might see her in there posting, you might see her commenting, but I just wanted to introduce her as like a formal part of the team. And our next call in two weeks from now, uh, Sandy's going to be our guest for the night. And I think we're going to do a deep dive into black bears, uh, maybe hear some stories from Africa, but maybe if you want to just unmute yourself and say hi really quick, Sandy, that would be great. Yeah, hi everybody. I recognize some familiar names here and it is super awesome to be just a part of this group. I'm really excited. So um, yeah, thank you for having me here. Awesome. So I just thought I'd have Sandy say hello so you know she's coming up. I'm gonna share my screen really quickly here too. Um, I'll just go over the schedule because I don't know it off the top of my head. Um, but coming up, uh, I think I've got these all up in here. Yeah, so in two weeks from today, we're going to have Sandy coming on and we're going to talking about black bears and Africa uh, tracking. Uh, end of March, March 29th. This is actually going to be the one kind of anomaly. It's going to be on a Wednesday. We've usually been doing these on the Thursdays. Uh, but Alexis Burnett from Earth Tracks Outdoor School is going to be coming on as our guest for the night. Uh, and we're going to be diving into bird language uh, and natural awareness. And But we say bird language, not just IDing the sounds, but what do they actually mean? what information is coming to us from the birds. So that'll be a fun night. Um, and then the week, or I think it's two weeks after that on May 4th, uh, I've got my friend, Carolyn Knapper, who's actually a biologist, uh, a fisheries biologist. And we're gonna be doing a deep dive, pun intended, into fish and water ecology as part of that call. So just thought I'd give a little um, update on the, the schedule coming up there. So let's, uh, let's dive into some bird stuff right now. And I'm going to actually just, I'm going to just double check that the sound's working out here. Can you give me a thumbs up if you can hear this? Is that coming through on your end? No way. Okay. Let's give this a... Okay, I'm going to have to share my screen, I guess, for this. I was hoping to make this a pop quiz um, for you, but uh, I guess we're just gonna look at them. So, so we're gonna go through a few birds here. You know what, if you wanted to, geez, how could I do this without you being able to see them? Um, here, let's double test that the sound's working this time. Oh no, are you not getting sound? Oh geez, we've done this before and never had an issue with it. Let me try. Well, sorry about that, crew. Let me give. Oh, here we go. I just forgot to hit one button. One last time here. <whistles> All right. Perfect. So we're going to go through a few common sounds of spring, just knowing that many of the birds are starting to sing and flock around right now. And you know what, if you wanted to do it like this, uh, you could close your eyes for this part if you want to push yourself a little bit. Because um, I'm going to go, yeah, why don't you do it? If you feel open to it, close your eyes since I have to share my screen here for the sound to come through. I'll figure out how to do that by next time. I don't know why we couldn't play it this time without me showing the videos. Uh, but I'm going to jump through a few different birds. Keep your eyes closed for this and then we'll come back and we'll take them up afterwards. Okay, so eyes closed and this is going to be bird number one on our quiz. Okay, keep your eyes closed. That was bird number one. Okay, bird number two. Okay, bird number three.
and I'm gonna do a, another version of that bird number three. So this, oh. so this is bird number three again, just a different version of it or variation. And then let's see, bird number, this will be bird number four. We're gonna do two more. Bird five. Should come again in a second, I think. Okay, and this is bird number six. Okay, I'm going to pick a random screen so that you can't hear what we just uh, or see the pictures and let's open your eyes come on back in and uh, we'll take up our quiz we'll go through one by one and I'll share uh, a couple tricks around them. But who oh I can't see the chat right now let me pull it up. Okay, bird number one. Anyone have thoughts on who bird number one was. Had that really nasally kind of sound to it. Me, me. Me, me. Nice. Whoever's on his guest, Paul. Sweet. We got some birders in the crew here. So the first bird we chatted uh, or pulled up was uh, this little guy here called the red breasted nuthatch. And they're singing like crazy right now, both them and the white breasted nuthatch. Oh, and I tried, just so folks know, I tried to pick birds that are over a very large region. So I know we have folks from the US down here, from the east, from the west. Um, so all the birds we pulled up here, I tried tried to pick had a, a pretty good range. So most people should have a bird or a similar bird in their area. So these guys are like about the size of a chickadee, um, you know, maybe a little bit bigger. Um, and I'll play the call one more time here. That's funny, what's going on? Oh, there we go. So the way that I like to remember this one, I call it the nasally nut hatch. It sounds like it has like a cold or something. Me, 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 and it's trying to squeak that out. The other one that's uh, kind of similar, uh, some of you might know. There's also a there's uh, a white breasted nut hatch, and I'll play its call just to so you can hear it. There we go. You'll notice the cadence is a little bit different. The red breasted does this single note, me, 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 whereas the white breasted tends to go me, 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 but it still has that nasally pitch to it. So see if you know what I, you can hear what I'm talking about with the nasally pitch. So there's where our nut hatch is. There's where our first two. Uh, what was the second one that we brought up? The second one on our list. Nice, Renato was on it. So our, our classic American Robin, um, which, um, yeah, I think Mo, we've all heard before, but you might not, if you're new to, you know, kind of birding by ear, you might not have really thought about its call much before. Um, so I'll play it quickly here and then we'll chat about it for a moment. The way that I was originally taught that one, and I kind of like this little uh, device for remembering it, is it saying, here I am, where are you? Here I am, here I am, where are you, where are you? And the way I always kind of remembered is like the robins have been singing in front of us their entire lives. Uh, you know, we've all heard them since we were little kids and some of us still don't know their call. So they're like, hey, where are you? I've been here the whole time. Where are you? Here I am, where are you? 
So that's the, the trick I always use for the, the Robin there. Here I am, where are you? Okay, what was the third one that we played? Can anyone remember it? It had that real, uh, um, I don't even know if I can make the sound. Can that, does anyone remember it? I gotta click on it and play it. Oh, uh, thank you, Christina just mentioned there's someone in the waiting room. Give me a second here. I don't know how to, oh yeah, look at that. There's a bunch of people in the waiting room. I'm gonna just admit all of them. I don't have a, an assistant on here. Hey, Sandy, if I made you a co-host, would you be able to let people in for me? Thanks for doing that. Hey, sorry for the folks that were in the waiting room there. Uh, we, we just set somebody up to be able to let you in. We got into something there. So uh, my apologies, but we'll, we'll dive back in. So the third bird that we were chatting about there was our Northern Cardinal. Um, so I'll play its call again. And we did two different variations. And then I'll play the other version over here. So the way I like to remember the Northern Cardinal is I think that the bird looks like a little like laser, like they're all red, like a laser beam. And I always think that its call sounds a bit like a laser beam. It's going like, choo, 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 choo. So that's, that's my silly little memory trick that I use for them. So I'll play it again. See if you can hear the laser beam in it. I feel like I'm playing laser tag, you know, and they're just going around and shooting each other with the laser tag games. If anyone ever played that growing up. There's a Northern Cardinal and then I'll play the other version. And you'll get with all of these birds, you'll get different kind of dialects in different areas. They might slight, slightly different, but that one really sounds like the laser to me there. So, okay, what was our fourth bird? I know I'm asking you a lot to remember. It was the one that went kind of like concrete over here. Anyone got that one? What was that bird? over here nice yeah a few people were on that one uh so that was our red winged blackbird uh wendy who's down in niagara said she the blackbirds are already singing down there which is wild uh you know we still have a ton of snow up here so um so let's jump over to the blackbird um and i'll give it a go Well, Sandy said back for three weeks in Ohio. Wild, what a different world. So for the red winged blackbird, uh, I always think they're saying like conquerie or over here. And then sometimes they'll throw in this like second sound. It's like, see you, see you. So I feel like they're going, I'm over here, see you. I'm over here, see you, see you. I'm over here. So just see if you can kind of hear that in there, at least the over here one over here over here okay so there's where our first four birds we're doing pretty good so far two more left uh what was the fifth one we played nice folks are pretty on these we got some birders in the crew we're gonna get progressive with these over the next couple of months so i'm starting with some easier or more common ones tonight although if they're all new to you that's all good um, but each call, we're going to add a couple new sounds. And I want to do some amphibian and frog sounds going forward too. So hopefully within two months from now, for folks that are coming up every call, we're really going to increase your, your birding by ear. And hopefully this spring, when you're out and about, you're going to start hearing some of these and be like, oh, I remember that one from the call. So yeah, our next one was the, the barred owl. Um, and this is a great time of year to listen for owls in the springtime. They can be very, very vocal this time of year. So I don't know if everyone's ever heard or everyone's heard that one, but I remember when I was in college, uh, what they taught us when I was at Fleming was it saying, who cooks for you? Who cooks for you all? So 
I don't know, another silly saying, but uh, but it, it made it stick for me anyway. Who cooks for you? Oh. Hopefully you can hear that in there. Awesome. Um, and then we had one last one. Anyone got the last one? Nice. Yeah, we have a few really great naturalists in here. So our last one was the, uh, the Eastern Screech Owl. Uh, and there's a Western Screech Owl as well. Uh, sounds a little bit different, although I find similar-ish pitch. Um, so here's kind of a fun one. It's a really eerie call out in the woods. Kind of one of my favorite things to be out in the woods at dark or like sitting around a campfire and to hear that call off in the distance. Uh, it's such a neat, eerie sound in the night. Let's do that again. I'd be curious in the chat, um, how many people got like five out of six or six out of six of those? If you had five or six, just put a put your number in there, five or six. Actually, even just write, write everyone. If you're open to sharing, write what you got in there. It's not a contest. You don't have to feel bad about it. I just want to get a gauge for the groups at, so I know kind of how far to push us with this uh, going forward. So where were people at? So if you got one, two, three, three, four, six, six, four, one, zero, two. Oh, good. We got a good mix. Okay, we have, yeah, quite a few that, uh, that are just getting started with their birds. You know what, why don't, we got time still tonight. Let's, let's have us all close our eyes again and let's, let's do the quiz again now that we've gone through them and we'll see if you improve your second time around. So I'm gonna invite everybody to close their eyes. Do your best to remember the order that we played in them. Or if you want to write them down, you could just look away from the computer. Uh, unfortunately, the only way I can share the sound right now is to share my screen. That's why you need to close your eyes. I'm gonna figure out how to, do that for uh, for next call. So, okay, eyes closed. Pop quiz. Starting now. So this is bird number one. Over here. Over here. See you. Okay, bird number one in our quiz. Bird number two. <laughs> you might remember I mentioned the nasally part of this one in the, the sound. Uh, let's see, bird number three is going to be, um, where is it? Right here. Here I am. Where are you? So that was bird number three. Bird number four. Bird number five. Our laser bird, that helps you. Okay, bird number six. It's gonna go again. Okay, let's restart it. Uh, 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 uh. 
And then we're going to do a bonus here. So keep your eyes closed. This is number seven, our bonus bird. Oh, we got them both. Going. Play that one more time. I kind of like that they're both going at the same time. This makes it more real for us, like we're outside. All right, let's see how we did this time. Hopefully people maybe improve just a little bit. So number one, who's got guesses number one? A conqueree. Nice, yeah, it looks like lots of people jumping in. Our red winged blackbird was our number one. Our second one, the nasally bird was our nasally nuthatch. Awesome. Bird number three, here I am, where are you? Yep, bird number three was a robin. Bird number four. Nice, our screech owl. Bird number five, our laser bird, which was five. Nice, cardinal. Bird number six. Who cooks for you? Our barred owl. And then our bonus bird, number seven. Who got the bonus bird? Nice. Bunch of folks in there. A song sparrow. Sweet. We'll, we'll dive into the sparrows in our future calls. I'm going to leave it there. How many people did better on the second go? Throw in a Y if you did a little bit better second time around. If you got at least one more. Awesome. Learning already. So as I said, we'll just keep kind of coming back to that week, uh, week after week um, and growing on that. I also wanted to just to, uh, I don't want to put you on the spot too much, but I, I, I introduced Sandy at the beginning of the call. Uh, I didn't notice that Christina Yu was on us. Uh, so Christina Yu has also been one of the, the guest instructors and mentors that's come in and out of the program. Uh, she was part of these uh, calls every single week uh, last winter. Um, and then uh, she got an amazing job out in Gross Morn Park. So she hasn't been as, as available, but I just wanted to give a quick shout out to Christina Yu for all of her support. And if you see her posting inside of the community, uh, you know, she's part of the, uh, the behind the scenes team, mentoring team as well. So, hey, Christina, you want to say hello? Sorry to put you on the spot, but. Hello. Oh, shoot. Hello. <laughs> it's freezing out here. Yeah, you got snow in Gross Morn? We have so much snow in Gross Morn. Yeah. Awesome. Well, glad you could tune in tonight. Okay. So, um, what I thought we'd do right now, we're gonna do a little breakout group session. And then when we get back, I've got a, a bit of a tracking presentation I put together and we're gonna be talking about some spring tracking techniques. Uh, or not necessarily techniques, but we're gonna be looking at some animals that are relatively easy to mix up. And some of them, their tracks become more common in the springtime. Uh, so we'll be doing a little bit of breakdown of some of those tracks. Um, but for this breakout group, what I was thinking we could do is, uh, we'll probably get into small groups of about four or so. And uh, I'd like to take this an opportunity to chat about what are some of the subtle signs of spring that you're either seeing or ones that you're aware of. You know, a lot of us know the real obvious signs of spring coming, you know, um, you know, the you start to see the geese flocking up or the big groups of ducks uh, in the ponds, you know, just south of wherever it's still kind of frozen. Um, you know, we know the maple sap starts to run in the, the maple trees. But what are some of the real subtle signs of spring uh, that start to tell us that it's coming? And what are some kind of fun tracks that are specific to spring that come to mind for you? So we're going to have a little bit of a, a community group brainstorm around that. Uh, the second question I'll maybe throw into that mix is what species of animals are actually mating right now? Because um, some animals actually mate uh, in the fall time uh, and then have a gestation period over the winter and then they give their litter. Some animals actually start to mate in the spring. So if you, if you run out of ideas of springs, you could brainstorm a little bit on, well, what animals are actually mating right now? And I'm gonna just share a couple of my um, favorite things from spring, a couple of signs, just to kind of get the, the wheels flowing for folks. Uh, and you can, you can think about what you wanna share. Well, I'm, I'm sharing a couple of things here. So I'm gonna jump over to my screen again here, and I'm actually gonna go up to this first slide. So here is a track, and actually we'll do a little track piece right now before we even do the breakout group here. I posted this one inside of our nature's language community today, but there's this tiny little mark on the tree right above the finger right there. Um, and it might be hard to see, but you can actually tell there's two tiny little teeth in there. 
There's one tooth right there. There's a second one right there. You can see it again up here. You can see it right there. You can see a little tooth mark right there. So tiny little teeth marks in the side of this tree. Um, so the question is, is who is making this track and what, uh, what are they doing? And this definitely is a sign of spring. Uh, one little clue is there's that little bit of snow in the background there. Uh, if anyone wants to take a stab at it, feel free to, to unmute yourself and jump in. Or if you have questions, you can do that or share in the chat. But anyone want to take a stab at what's starting to happen here? A squirrel getting sap. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. So this is uh, called sap tapping. Um, so up here, the red squirrels on the maple trees, usually starting in March when the maples start to run, will actually come and bite at the trees. And I, I wanted to show you this next picture here because this is a cool one here. Now, this isn't a squirrel. This was actually a porcupine chew uh, on a maple tree, but in the springtime. So everything loves this maple sap in the spring. But here's, uh, here's some little slugs coming in. Um, and, and I think sick sucking up the sap there as well. So, um, so yeah, yeah, sap tapping from squirrels. That's a fun one that we start to see. Squirrels will also territorial mark in the springtime too. And they'll literally go and chew at the tops of branches and prominent spaces and they'll use their glands and they'll scent mark on them. We often don't think of, you know, often when we think about scent marking, we think about things like beavers or maybe like foxes and wolves or deer rubbing their antlers. Um, but if you didn't know, squirrels will actually do that as well. So there's a fun spring track that you can start watching out for uh, is squirrel scent marking and squirrel sap tapping, um, which is also a sign that maybe it's time to get the taps in the tree for your maple syrup. Uh, of course, another thing that starts to happen in the, the springtime, uh, usually in March, is we have our, our little weasels start to shift from their, their white winter coats into their dark uh, brown summer coats. I actually saw an ermine uh, on my front porch uh, last week, which is really cool. Or not an ermine, sorry, a least weasel which is this tiny little guy on the left there. Uh, and he was still all white. Uh, but over the next month, he'll be starting to change his coat, him and she, both of them. Um, so kind of our ermines, our long tail weasels, our short tail weasels, um, our, our least weasels, all start to change their coats. So there's a couple of things going on for spring. Um, interesting enough, you might see a lot of displaying from ravens and crows this time of year, mate, mating displays happening. Um, they're potentially even, depending on where you are, finished breeding by now and even have their first litter of eggs going on. Or not their first litter, that's the wrong word, but <laughs> are, are laying legs and, and tending eggs all over. So where I live, uh, the first birds that lay are the gray jays, followed by the ravens. Uh, and they're often doing that by February, end of February, early March, which is amazing. And before that, you'll see the, the mating rituals of the ravens as they're doing their courtship, flying around and trying to impress the females. So watching the ravens is a fun thing to do this time of year, watching the crows, watching the jays, some of those earliest uh, breeders to see their mating behaviors. Um, what else is kind of fun happening this time of year? Uh, oh, squirrels, uh, just aggressive behavior. So you'll often see the men fighting the male squirrels, and then you'll see the males chasing the females around. So this is a fun time of year to see like extra squirrel activity going on. Uh, there's tons going on in the fish world. You know, things like pike and walleye are getting ready to spawn and they go into like staging areas, often near the edges of rivers. Um, so yeah, those are a few of the things, you know, that I think about in the springtime. But let's go into a breakout group. And again, the question, share a couple of signs of spring, um, either that you've seen or that you know of and look forward to. And then um, what's breeding right now for animals? And we'll just have a fun little brainstorm session around that. So give me a second here. I'm going to just put us in our breakout room. All right, welcome back everybody. Uh, I jumped around through the breakout groups a little bit uh, just to be a fly on the wall there and there's some great chats going on. So that was fun. Hopefully everybody enjoyed that. Um, I'm curious if anybody has, uh, wants to just share quickly, knowing that we were all in different rooms, was there anything that like was really unique that came up in your breakout room that you're like, whoa, I had no clue. That was super rad. Uh, if somebody has something that really jumps out, it'd be fun just to, to throw a couple of them out to the Brigader group. Petra, yeah, do you want to go for it? Oh, you're still muted. <laughs> the it's the one that brought it up in our group. Um, the observation of maybe you know something more about it, but but what comes up for me is the um, the query, and I'm super new, so I know nothing. But the thing is, okay, what is climate change? How is climate change impacting these observations we're making, which are like some people saying, oh, it's like very 
warm and this and that's happening, unusual patterns. So that's a nice little observation, but how is that affecting down the road? And what impact is this climate change having on our uh, environment and wildlife? I don't know, the animals and how can be like tapping maple syrup really early and then maybe it gets cold again, and then it gets warm and you know, how's this all happening, impacting? Yeah, that's, that's a super interesting one. You know, when tracking these cycles year after year, um, I feel like give us a lot of tools to work with to actually track change. Um, yeah. Some of you might've been part of, I had a, a friend of mine come on around this time last year, Caleb Musgrave. Uh, he's for, over from Hiawatha First Nation um, and a very, very knowledge, uh, Nishinaabe knowledge keeper there. And uh, he was talking about the, uh, what they call the crow moon or the sugar moon in March. Um, and, you know, basically he used to say to me that like, he would always watch for when the crows were starting to flock together in big groups as a sign that the maple trees were going to start to run again. Um, wow. And he's been noticing the last few years that the crows and the, the maple tree uh, have not been aligning like they have for generations and wow. generations, uh, the cycle between the two. So, um, so I think there's all kinds of subtle cycles there related to, to the one you brought up there, Petra. Did, did anyone else have anything that really jumped out at them that they're like, well, that was a really cool nature thing I've never thought of. I want to go look for that. Anyone else want to share one before we move on to the next piece? Feel free just to unmute yourself or, or throw something in the chat. Going once, going twice. <laughs> I'll <laughs> offer something. This is Dusty talking. Um, hi, hi, Petra, is that you who said hi? I was going to yes. say hi to you. <laughs> hi, Chris. I've seen you with Earth Activist training stuff. Um, yeah. Um, 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 so I live in what my neighbor calls an urban forest, but I used to live in the real forest. So, but I'm glad I have some nature and so, so nature around me. And I asked um, if people who were more knowledgeable of me than I might be able to help me know what this one track is. Cause I don't, I notice all these things, but I don't know the names of them and all that. And, um, and it's like this, about this big around and about this deep. So this deep, about this big around just one of them like every three or four feet and i'm and i was thinking maybe that's a sign of spring because i haven't seen these in a while and i'm in northern california so the weather's really crazy here but um luke said that he thought maybe it would be some kind of a larger cat you know not like a little domestic cat mm. um and and i didn't know all this but he shared because they walk um oh i forget the word that he used they walk in their own tracks yeah, cool. and, yeah, and my yard isn't even or something, you know. So and so, you know, maybe it's just like, well, anyway. So, so that was remark. That was awesome for me because I've been trying to figure that out for a really long time. And although it's not, and I know there are mountain lions and deer and all kinds of stuff that come through here because I'm close to a waterway, even though I'm pretty close to downtown, and I miss the real forest. But anyway, well, it's we'll nice. get some pictures and share them with us. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, we'll take a look and see. Thank you. Awesome. Cool. I think, folks, what I'd like to maybe do right now, I'm going to, as I said, I'm going to do a little bit of a presentation on some uh, some animals that we start to see more of in the springtime uh, and some of the different species that are pretty easy to mix up. Uh, and then I'm going to leave everybody with a little bit of a, a tracking challenge for the next little bit. But since we've been on almost an hour right now, why don't we just take uh, a little five minute break so people can go to the washroom, stretch, uh, maybe even go outside, get a breath of fresh air. So let's come back in five minutes and then I'm going to share a little spring tracking talk. So. Yeah. Have you seen the, uh, the bear marking trees on the beach trees up north where they'll climb the trees and you'll see the claw marks going up the side of the trees. Oh, mm -hmm. they, they, they actually call yes. them bear nests, but they'll go up and they'll sit in a little crook up in the tree and they'll reach yes. out and it looks like a big stick nest, like almost like an eagle nest where yeah. they'll reach out and they'll break the branches inwards. And they're not actually making a nest. They're just eating the beech nuts off them. But it's right. this big mass of broken sticks up in the trees. Right. So that's always a neat one to come across too. Yeah. There was a, an off trail off the Mizzy Trail in Algonquin Park that, that uh, there was a sign just at the, yeah, the beginning of the trail. And that's where they said that the, the beech trees were, were full of these nests as you referred to. Right. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to jump back into our slideshow and we're going to look at some uh, common animals that we see in the springtime and chat a little bit about their tracks. And I think, I don't know how far of a range of, of regions that we have people from, but uh, these animals should be pretty common 
uh, across a, a pretty large track of North America. So okay, give me a second here. I'm just going to share my screen. All right. So we're gonna, I'm gonna invite people to chat a little bit during this as well. And again, for, you can either write in the chat or you can unmute yourself. So here is track one. Um, and we're gonna look at three in a row, but maybe if anyone wants to just share in the chat, some, some top guesses who we might be looking at. So we've got a pen there that gives us some scale, right? Mm -hmm. um, you can maybe get in there and count toes. You can see some shapes. So throw, throw some ideas in the chat of who we might be looking at here. Pretty common animal. You could find this in the wilderness. You could find it. Someone said skunk. Someone said raccoon. Yeah, I like I like both of those. Okay, we'll leave it. We're gonna leave it with there. We're gonna look at all uh, three or four prints actually, and then we're gonna come back. So here's the next print we're gonna look at. Okay, what do you think about track number two now? Throw in some guesses for track number two. Anyone got some ideas? This one, we don't quite have the same scale, uh, but I'll just tell you it's similar to in size to that last picture we looked at. Renato was saying some sort of mustelid, someone saying a fisher, somebody saying a skunk. Hmm. Cool, Th those are all great, great guesses. I, I don't think any of those are, are totally uh, ridiculous. So if someone saying a mink, Okay, track number three, and we'll break these down afterwards. I find all of these look similar. They're all similar size. You could find them all in similar habitats and locations. Nice, you got a couple people saying possum. Awesome, <laughs> awesome possum. <laughs> cool, a lot of people are hitting up that one. And then one more here, trick number five, or track number five. And there's two sets here. So share your thoughts on this, and then we'll go and break these ones down, have a little chat about each of them. Someone's saying an otter, maybe. Got a beaver. So again, we've got that lighter in there for scale. You can see that front foot is, you know, about the size of the lighter. The back foot's a little bit bigger. Any other guesses? Throw a couple more. We've got otter. We've got beaver. We've got raccoon back in there. we got mink. Awesome. Cool. Let's break these down. So our three prints, um, there's three different animals throughout those four slides. We have raccoon, we have skunk, and we have a possum. And all cool. three of them, I think, are, are pretty it's pretty reasonable to think that you could mix any one of them up because you can find them all in similar habitats. They're all very similar in size. Um, they also, something else that's common between all of them is they all have five toes. So they might be hard to see in this one here, but if I look at this top track, you folks can see my cursor, right? Mm -hmm. Moving around. Yeah, so we've got toe one, toe two, toe three, toe four, toe five, and then these tiny little claw marks coming off the top of it. It's a little bit more skewed in that one. And then we look at the pen there and it gives us a piece of scale and it's got this big, long heel pad. Mm. So our, top, our first one here, this is a raccoon. A bunch of folks showed, showed that one, but it's not as well, uh, as clear as this last one. So this fourth picture, this was also the raccoon. Um, you know, when I think about raccoons, I always think they just look like little people hands. It's like a baby walking. They've got these really long mm. fingers, right? They show claws. Um, Usually their back foot actually looks a bit more like a back foot on a human and their front foot is a little bit more spread out, almost like a front foot on a human as well. So I really think about the raccoon like a little baby, but the big long toes, right? Uh, the claws and then the baby like appearance. And then here it is in the snow, just as a comparison there. You can't see the toes quite as much, but you still get what I'm saying there, I hopefully about the little baby uh, look. So if I come back there, there's just in this light skiff of snow. And it's amazing how the conditions can really make a track look different from one spot to the next. Uh, and it's one reason why tracking really is such an art, right? Um, so there's the raccoon, is that, that one there. So next one here, actually, let's do the opossum next. Um, so the opossum is like almost identical. The big thing that gives it away though, if you look at this bottom track here, see how the thumb is sticking way out to the side there? Mm -hmm. I'm gonna even highlight it with this one here. 
Um, so on the possum, they have their first four. This is on the back foot, right? And this is what it gives the opossum that ability to sit and hang off of branches and stuff so comfortably, right? They've got an opposable, almost like a, to an extreme level opposable thumb uh, on that back foot that allows them to hang there. Other than that though, it's very similar to, um, to a raccoon. And like, if you looked at just the front foot there, you know, the only real difference between that and a raccoon uh, is just that it's spread out a little bit more, right? Um, hey, Sandy, can you let that person in the waiting room? I'm not able to do it because I've got the highlight thing on there. Um, so looking at this one here, if I was to just, well, I'll just draw the fingers again there, right? One, two, three, four, five. So very much like a raccoon. You've got the claws up there registering still. You've got the long fingers. Um, the only real difference that I can see from the, hold on, let me just clear all drawings. My mouse from the raccoon is the raccoon is just a little bit more like kind of dense. But even if you were to only see this print here and this print here, like raccoon from possum is actually pretty tricky. They're pretty similar, right? <laughs> um, it's a little bit more spread out, but that thumb, if you can see the back foot is the real diagnostic one on the opossum versus the raccoon. So the fourth one that we looked at here, uh, this is a fun one right here. And I think we had, what did we have on this one again? We had some people say mink. I think maybe we had a fisher. What were people thinking on this one again? Anyone want to throw in some guesses? Throw in your guesses again for this one. Yep, someone's still saying Fisher. So let's see what information that we have from this track. There's a few things that are helpful in this one. So uh, I'll go down to my annotate here again. Let's see. So we can count toes, right? Uh, and it's, we got one, we've got, let's see, there's a second one over there, three, four. I think there's maybe a fifth one in there. It's kind of hard to tell over in this one here. One, two, three, four, looks like one down there. So it looks like we got an animal with five toes here. So there's one interesting piece. Something else that stands out really different for me on this track than the other ones though, is notice how there's this really distinct line of snow that's left right there. And then again, right there, we have it up here, right there, right there, right here, right here, right here, and right there. So we actually have this like two part. Um, so we call it the metacarpal pad or the metatarsal. So on the front foot, it's the metacarpal pad. Uh, and on the rear foot, it's the metatarsal. So there's clearly a pad right here and a pad right here with like a little space in between there where there's probably fur or a little bit of an indent on it, right? So that's something very distinctive because if I go back over to the, uh, the raccoon print here, we don't see that on the raccoon print. We just see one big flat heel pad, right? When I go over to the opossum, same kind of thing. We kind of see a big flat heel pad. This one here is kind of, you know, there's a little bit of a hump in the middle, but it's still just one solid heel pad. Whereas this, there's definitely multiple different parts to the heel pad. So that's one thing that's really diagnostic about this species right here. Um, the other thing is actually the, the long space between the toe and the nails itself. So look at this, the end of the toe, oh, hold on, I'm gonna do this again here. The end of the toe is right here. Look at how far ahead the nails are. The nails way mm -hmm. up here. So what this tells me is this animal has a big, long nail like that, that sticks way out further in front of the toe. Those nails are way longer than our other species there, right? So that's very di di diagnostic of this track. And then the other thing that's really diagnostic, it's just very boxy, like if you look at it. I don't know if that, if you kind of follow me on this. Yeah, Alex just said something there, long claws for digging, right? So those long claws actually tell us something about its diet. It's actually an animal that uh, eats a lot of insects. Um, insects, grubs, things like that. It has those long claws. And it's kind of neat when you get into tracking how much you, without even knowing what the animal is, just looking at the shape of the skull, the features, looking at the feet, we can start to make all kinds of guesses about the animal's life strategy and even its diet based on what shows up in its class, claws. So that tells us that the animal digs, 
Um, and often these animals are, are digging for insectivores. Yeah, Kevin, you nailed it. This is a skunk here. Wow. Um, great one. So I'm going to just uh, share a couple of the key features. I've got another slide down here for the skunk. Um, so I'll zoom out a little bit here. Actually, I'm going to show you one other thing here. So here's a trail of the skunk walking. Um, and if you follow this trail, this isn't maybe the best example, but have you ever heard the saying of a drunk skunk? One of the other characteristics of a skunk is they often tend to meander. And, you know, I've seen it do it way more than this, but if I follow this on a line, you can see it kind of curves like this way a bit, and then it curves in a little bit this way, and then it curves back over, and then it curves way over here, and then it curves across like that as it goes. Most animals are very efficient with their movement. They move in a straight line from point A to point B. Skunks do this drunk skunk thing. And, you know, again, if we think about life strategy and the other features of these animals, the fact that it's able to defend itself with its smell uh, by spraying actually allows it the luxury to not move super efficiently across the landscape. It can kind of meander, it can move slow, right? Because it has this amazing defense mechanism. Um, you know, bears, uh, porcupines are not very efficient in the way that they move. I shouldn't say they're not efficient, but they're, well, yeah. You know, if you think about like the efficiency of a wolf, the efficiency of a deer and the body mechanics of their body and how gracefully they move across the landscape, whereas porcupines are slow, they waddle, they're awkward, but they have, again, they're flat footed in the way that they walk, but they have this amazing defense system. So that defense system actually shows up in the track and the way that they move across the landscape. So I'm going to just uh, clear that again. Give me a second. So that drunk skunk saying there, uh, and just to go back to the slide here, so the, a couple other things. So they've got the, the five toes, front foot and back, uh, that staggering drunk skunk walk, the nails register way further ahead. And then the last one that I find is really helpful is that they tend to have this boxy pattern where you get these two toes on the side and then these front three register almost in a straight row. Like there's not many other animals where you get that those three fingers all in a straight row like that. Uh, right here. And that's what kind of creates the boxy look to it. So those are all classic skunk signs. And you tend to see more skunk, opossum, and raccoon behavior this time of year. So there's challenge one for your homework from tonight is to start watching for those tracks that are kind of, you know, yay big in size and start to differentiate. Is that a raccoon? Is that a possum? Or is that a skunk? As you see them as you go about your day. Okay. Uh, any questions about that one before I move on to the next one? The other one that I wanted to throw out here, um, and this is a fun little challenge for folks, is to think about the difference between chipmunks and squirrels if you have them in your area. Squirrels are active, at least where I am, the red squirrels are active all winter long. The gray squirrels are fairly active even in the winter time. But the chipmunks, you almost never see them until kind of March. So we're basically going into the time of year where you see the, the chipmunks starting to come out. Um, Similar to our skunk track there, um, the red squirrel has five toes and it still has that boxy pattern with like the three in a row there. Its heel pad looks very different though. It's got all the little bulbs there. But how do you tell a, a red squirrel from a chipmunk? And if you don't have chipmunks where you are or you don't have red squirrels in your habitat, then your challenge is gonna be, well, what are your small rodents? What squirrels do you have? And how might you tell them apart by their tracks? Um, so. Chipmunks and red squirrels, their, their feet are going to actually look very similar. Uh, their pattern is going to look similar where the two fronts <laughs> land first and the two backs come past them. Uh, what's going to make them different is their trail width. If I was to actually measure uh, the outer width of the track there. And here's a little trick if you don't know this one. I think this is a great one. We're actually going to cover a few species here going on this one. But everyone hold up their hand for a second. I want to see you holding it up on the screen. So hold up your hand. So a quick little guide, it might not be perfect for your hand, it's pretty rough for mine, but if I think about the trail width of a, a species moving through the ground, if I put out my thumb, that's about the trail width of most of our shrews, our tiny shrews. If I put up two fingers, that's roughly the trail width of a mouse or a vole. Oh, uh, three fingers, and it's usually actually a little wider than three fingers, is usually about the trail width of a chipmunk. <laughs> Four fingers, a red squirrel. Five fingers, a gray squirrel. So that's my quick reference, guys. When I'm out in the woods and I see that classic bounding pattern, 
I throw down my two fingers and I say, okay, is it a mouse? Nope. Is it a chipmunk? Nope. Is it a red squirrel? Ah, oh, cool. It's a red squirrel. Or no, it's too big. It must be a gray squirrel. So there's a quick little reference guide. If you don't have those same species where you are, I bet you you could come up with an equivalent with your local rodents. Uh, and the shrew mouse bowl probably would apply in your area. So there's just a fun little trick there. So challenge number two for your homework is to go and look at your rodent tracks uh, and try to differentiate, was that a chipmunk that's coming out for the first glance of sun of the spring? Or is that a red squirrel? Um, so there's your other little homework one for today. Hmm. I want to take up one question that somebody brought up. We actually had a couple people mentioning minks and fishers. I'll show you this one here. This is actually a mink and a fisher side by side here. Um, or sorry, I mean um, red squirrel on the left and a mink on the right here. So size-wise there, the big difference you're going to get, you can see how they're actually, again, similar in size, the actual tracks, and even look kind of similar. But if you look at the red squirrel, remember there's that little boxy part I talked about with those three prints side by side, whereas mm -hmm. on here, they're kind of spread out more. Mm -hmm. See, the you have one there, one over here, and those three in a row. You don't get that little boxy thing in the mink. The other one is that the squirrels only have four toes on their front feet. So one, two, three, four. Whereas the weasel actually has five toes on each of its feet. One, two, three, four, five. So that's really helpful. And then the heel pads are quite different as well. The squirrels have these little bulbs on them for climbing. Uh, whereas the weasels kind of come down into this point here. So there's just a little uh, mink. Uh, versus a red squirrel there. So I'm gonna jump into our community right now. So this is actually the nature's language uh, course. So for the people that are actually enrolled in our full course, uh, we have a community here where we'll share and chat about tracking pictures. And this is a picture, this Kevin, we're gonna look at your picture right now. Um, so this is a, a post that Kevin had made in the community just the other day. Um, so we'll start off here, you can see this animal looks like it's doing some sort of jump, right? Jump, it's going down into the deep in the snow, jump, looks like it's crossing some water here. And then you can see it kind of gets into some uh, shallower snow there. So we scroll down here and we start to see, oh, okay, we get a little bit more detail in here. Uh, and I'm starting to see this pattern emerge. It looks like I've got a single track, I've got two tracks, a single track, and then there's a space. Single track, looks like two tracks there, single track, space single track to single space. So that tells me that the animal is doing this thing called a lope. Um, that's the pattern. And that's something we get into quite a bit in the course is how do we actually read the speed the animal's going by the pattern? And what does that tell us? Um, but we have some sort of loping animal, looks pretty big in size. And this is great, Kevin, I'm glad you threw that 20 in there because now it gives us some size reference here. So now we're seeing some toes here and we can start to count the toes. And we've got one, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. Um, so I'd like to get some folks' thoughts on who we might be looking at here. And Kevin, if you want to add anything to this uh, info to this, feel free just to jump in. But in this chat, who has some thoughts on what species we might be looking at here? Yeah, otter. Mm -hmm. Nice. Yeah, Alex just threw otter there. I heard somebody else. So Kevin, you were thinking fisher, I believe, right? So fisher and otter are really hard to tell apart sometimes. Um, and I've even seen, you know, a lot of people say, you know, know about the belly slide, how otters will run and slide on their mm -hmm. bellies. Mm -hmm. I've actually seen fisher's belly slide before too. Not no, usually wow. nearly as far or nearly as often, but they will do it from time to time. Nice. Uh, they're, they're both weasels. So they both have five toes on their front foot and five on their back. Um, and their feet, the, the size of their prints are almost the same. They're almost identical. Oh yeah, Alex just said she's seen mink belly slide as well. I've seen mink do it too, uh, mm -hmm. for sure. So here is what, uh, and I'd be curious, Sandy and Christina, um, what your folks are thoughts on this, but I'm inclined to say that I think this is actually not a fisher, it's an otter. And what mm -hmm. I'm basing it off of is, is this one print here, and I'm gonna see if I can draw on this again. See this toe? This is like a tiny little diagnostic thing, but look at this. Oh, hold on, this is gonna let me draw. See how that toe right there, and then these ones are up here if I was drawing the leading edge. So if I draw the leading edge of this toe, and then I draw this, what we call the metacarpal pad right here, look at how low down that one toe is right there. 
if I was to draw a line across here, that one toe is basically like even or even a little bit below the top of the metacarpal pad. I might have, or metatarsal. I might have drawn it a little, I should have maybe drawn that just a touch lower. But so that is a huge diagnostic piece for me. Now, any given track can throw it off a little bit. I'm going to stop my share here and I'm going to go back to a slide for a second. Um, and we'll have a look okay, at the difference between an otter and a fisher. Um, so here's a clear otter track in the mud. And again, you can see here's the metacarpal pad right here, our metatarsal. And here's the toe way down here. Versus if I look at our general, like our weasels, like our fisher, this isn't actually, that's a fisher track, but it's not very clear. This is a pine marten, but generally the toes are actually up much higher. I wish I had a better print of a, of a fisher right now to show. But if, if this was a fisher track right here, I would expect this toe to actually be way up here, like kind of more in line with those other ones. And the reason that toe is so low is because that otter has a web back foot, right? So with that web back foot, that's where the webbing is coming up there, which allows it to be so much more efficient. Again, looking at the track here is actually telling us about the animal's life strategy and how it moves across the landscape. That big wide space where the flap comes across is what allows it to swim so efficiently in water. Because the fisher doesn't have that, its toe is gonna to register up higher here. But that's kind of one of the main reasons that um, I think that that track we were just looking at is actually an otter, not a fisher going across. I'm curious, uh, any, anyone else think it's a fisher and wanna challenge me on that? I, I welcome it. And I'd be curious, particularly Sandy or Christina, if you agree with me or if you, if you think it's a fisher. Everyone gonna accept my answer or anyone wanna challenge me? It's, it's it's Kevin here. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So 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 the, the reason why I kind of thought it was a fisher is um, I, I have a trail camera up in that area. Yeah. Um, I've had it up for about two years, and then recently I, I got a shot of something that looked like a fisher. I don't know if yeah. You, like, look over my shoulder here, right there. Yeah. And mm -hmm. and uh, I was like trying to figure out like what is it? It, it kind of looked weasel like. Um. But uh, yeah, yeah. So I was, I was kind of guessing. Like all of a sudden, I saw this track which I never saw in previous winters, and I thought, well, maybe this is like uh, a fisher that's moved into the area or something like that. But, but yeah, it could be any muscolid, really. Yeah. Um, well, the, the, as I said, the fisher and otter, and you could very well have both of them there, right? Maybe. Yeah. Uh, like they'll co-inhabit the same areas. Um, and, and to be honest, you know, I'm always careful, like to call that uh, one or the other from one individual print. Because any given print can get a little bit skewed, you know, especially if it's running on ice, you know, its thumb could slide down a little bit. So any given track could be a bit skewed. So I don't want to say 100% that it's, it's an otter over a fisher, but I'm definitely leaning towards an otter on that one. Um, but, uh, but if you got a fisher on the trail cam, they're probably both in the area there. So um, and, and that's the one, you know, if you go, if you get those tracks again, Kevin, and you're able to go follow it, really pay attention to that thumb and see if you can find that across multiple tracks. Yeah, for um, sure. Because if it's a fisher, it's going to consistently land up higher. If it's an otter, it's going to consistently land down lower. That's specific to the rear foot. Yeah, good to know. Awesome. Mm -hmm. But I'm I'm going to vote I'm going to vote fisher on that one. So, or sorry, I mean otter on that one. <laughs> no, Wendy, that's a great question. People always say that. Would distance from the water determine that? So we always associate uh, otters with the water. But otters travel from lake to lake, oh, yeah. you know, I've been two, three kilometers away from a lake up on like big oak ridges and found otter tracks up there before. So you can definitely get otter tracks that are kilometers or, or miles for the Americans in the crowd tonight away from water bodies. So just because they're water dominant species doesn't mean they won't travel over land. And usually they kind of have a cycle where they'll go and they'll hunt one water body for a period of time. And then they'll move to another body and they have like kind of a big loop that they do of different lakes and rivers and they'll go between them. Uh, so it's not uncommon to find otters a fair ways away from water. Hmm. So maybe one more thing to add, um, just out of, uh, for, for interest is, so I found that those tracks along the creek, but I followed them and they went up a hill and this hills, you know, it's like 300 feet high, steep. Right. And, and they kind of like, went all over the place and it kind of followed it to the top of the hill and there was an intersecting track of fox as well up there 
Okay. I think the fox had caught something because there's the random drips of blood with his tracks. And I was kind of wondering, like, oh, did this other animal smell that? Mm. And it was try, you know, trying to trace it down, right? It was, and it, it got kind of um, chaotic to figure out what was happening because there's a lot of intersecting tracks up there. Yeah. Um, yeah. Awesome. Trailing is so much fun to actually follow an animal over, over a chunk of time there and, and piece together the story of what's going on. You know, if you were following it over a period, another one that might lean towards fisher over otter would be if you started to see it climbing up trees, right? Because a fisher is much more comfortable and not to say an otter can't climb, uh, but a fisher is much more comfortable off the ground. Um, so there's another thing that might take you more into the fisher club if you trailed it. Hey, Sandy, did you have a chance to look at that last print or did you drop out before that when we were looking at the yeah, I don't know. Um, I my internet kicked out. I'm hot spotting through my phone now, uh, so I a little bit of time there. But I know it was a Fisher, and then I lost you. So cool. It's it's posted in the community. We're having a debate of Fisher versus Otter, and I'm voting Otter. But uh, I would love okay. it if you jump in there and, and share your thoughts sometime. Yeah, is it in the? Uh, the it's, it's in the Mighty Net community and in Nature's Language. So have a look yeah, sometime. I've been hanging out there today, so I'll just I'll, I'll be right in there. I can't stand not seeing it. Thanks. Awesome. Cool crew. Um, we're going to wrap up in just a, a moment here. So um, yeah, I wanted to just kind of, first off, thanks everyone for joining us tonight. Hopefully you had a great time. Um, Sandy is going to be our guest in two weeks from today. And we're going to be diving into, we're going to be chatting about tracking bears. Actually, we're going to be chatting about some stories from Africa. Um, who knows what else we'll get into. And for those of you that aren't part of the nature's language community, this is kind of what we do on the call. So inside of the course, uh, I'm actually just going to show you something. Give me a half second here. Um, oh, that's not the one. Shared the wrong screen. Let me try this again. This one here. So we have this course community built. It's inside of a, a platform called Mighty Networks. And inside of there, we actually have a whole bunch of pre-recorded. It actually shows us live right now. Uh, we have all these pre-recorded lessons with videos. We've got workbooks, uh, kind of breaking down all the different aspects of wildlife tracking. Uh, there's lessons in here on bird language, um, amphibian calls. Uh, if I scroll down here, um, learning from the birds, there's a whole bunch of lessons. So those are all pre-recorded lessons you can do at your own pace anytime you want. And then of course we have our events, which are what we call the virtual campfires where we come together like this and we basically get together with other people that are passionate about the outdoors and uh, inspire each other. We share our stories, we, we learn some things. Um, so we've got all about bears with Sandy. We've got bird language with Alexis end of March. Uh, we got Carolyn coming in to talk about fish and water ecology. So that's kind of what our, our uh, monthly calls look like. And enrollment is open right now. So if you would like to join in with us and keep coming to these calls, we would love to have you in the community. You also have the ability to post pictures inside of there. Uh, and there's a sale on right now. It's $75 off for the next few days. Basically, the price is going to go back up, um, I think, Monday next week. Uh, so if you'd like to join us, we'd love to have you in the crew. Um, and if you don't join us, I hope you enjoyed tonight and that you found this worthwhile in and of itself. So, um, I'll leave it there and say, thanks everybody. Uh, hope you enjoyed the evening. I sure did. Uh, thanks Sandy for piping in and, uh, excited for your next talk. Nice to have you on here, Christina and, uh, have a good night, everybody. Cheers. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks, thanks Chris. Chris. <laughs> thanks, oh, I should throw the link. You. Just go to my website, chrisoutdoors.ca and you'll see nature's language in there if you want to register. So. Okay. Say hi to Laura.